Discover Next, the studio for facades and design. Next is the platform for innovation in the field of building envelopes, for inspiration, information and communication. Initiated by Vicona, with leading industry experts as Next partners. Next is a unique concept which is constantly evolving and bringing the future of cities to life. Hello and welcome, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to hear the second international Next Facade Summit. And in front of us are two hours of extreme interesting personalities, food for thought, information, and I'm pretty sure you will get also some friction for your daily work day after. We have been honored by having four very, very good, famous speakers with us from the Bialki English Group in New York. Kai-Uwe Bergmann is joining us. In addition, here in the studio in Frankfurt, I'm glad and happy to welcome Juan Lucas Young from Saubo Hatten as well as Peter Olbert from Hadi Teherani. And the end of that session, in approximately one hour and 30 minutes, we travel, our journey will go into Dubai, and then we will welcome my beloved Agnes Koltai. Welcome to all of you from San Francisco. Yes, exactly, San Francisco, early in the morning, sipping the cup of coffee until Beijing, close to go to the bed. More than 1,000 viewers on the screens, that's great to get that understanding from your side that is worth to join in, and in addition, more than 50 nations. Join me for that kind of event, and in addition, we also would like to have you just a, a small information. I checked with my team beforehand, you see more or less the ribbon in yellow, we all are tested on COVID, we all are negative, which is positive these days, and we have some people here in the audience. So when, when you hear someone clapping hands, it's not too much, but we are all attested. So just remind that when we are also standing close together. Kai-Uwe Bergmann, located in New York from Bianchi English Group. He will not join in person for sure, of course, but he has broadcasted his presentation and also we have also broadcasted beforehand his introduction speech. But we have one person who really introduced Kai-Uwe Bergmann to us, and this is Thorsten. Thorsten, just join in and give us some first thought and information about that things. Of course, we always talk about the next studio here in Frankfurt, but what is the next studio for you as one of the partners? Yeah, thank you, Werner, for the introduction. Well, uh, as my company, Paul, is a partner of the next studio approximately since three years, we really uh, appreciate and are amazed how the next studio community mm -hmm developed over the past years mm -hmm. and uh, we appreciate the partnership concept and the opportunity in participating and organizing such events mm -hmm. and we are more than happy that due to the digital approach of our events we found such a huge international audience just today i mean just reflecting on all your projects you and your company did what would you like to see today from kai uwe bergmann that's a straight question and I have a, a straight answer. As uh, our company, our core business is uh, high sophisticated uh, metal facade cladding. I'm really looking forward to see uh, a project Kai Uwe is uh, presenting, which is called The Smile. Mm -hmm. It's a huge residential building in the Harlem, uh, in, the, in the Manhattan district of East Harlem, excuse me. Uh, where we supplied um, black blasted stainless steel panels. Great. Thank you, Thorsten. You're welcome. And of course, as good tradition, I try to prepare a little bit myself for each and every single speaker. Kai-Uwe Bergmann, most of you might know him. He joined the Bjarke English Group more than 15 years ago, which is more or less close to when Bjarke English Group was founded. In addition, all of you might know that Kai-Uwe is an architect. He has his education from the uh, University of uh, Virginia. And here, in addition, maybe worth to mention, 2019, he was awarded to become part of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architecture. And here, the very, very interesting part is, you are just by invitation coming into that kind of 
Council. That's pretty interesting from Kai-Uwe Bergman, and I also checked a little bit his personality, and he's very much, much a mathematic architect, I would even say, because he said he's clear-cut, he's straight, and he's full of energy when he goes into his projects. Three projects I just noticed myself when it comes to Bianchi Ingel groups, and one of them is in my personal tick box to visit. The first project is the Musier Atelier Audemars Piquet, in, uh, Switzerland. The second one is abbreviated called ARC, Coppen Hill in Copenhagen. It's a recycling facility and all of you who have snowboard downhill uh, mist during the winter season, Copenhagen is the place to go because the sloped roof is exactly for downhill of skiing and snowboarding. And the third one is one of the most interesting one I'm pretty sure kai -U will tell about it. It's called the Big U. Climate change is happening, and one of the most vulnerable areas is Manhattan area. And 10 kilometers protection line, this is the design intent for the Bianchi Ingels group. And it's called Big U because the shape is a U, but the abbreviation of Bianchi Ingels group, B-I-G, is Hood. Hood is a Danish word. In German, it is Haut. Hood means the skin. So as a skin, the intention is to build a shelter for Manhattan to avoid more or less the negative impacts of climate change. Looking forward into the presentation of Kai-Uwe Bergmann. Looking forward to that, and let's just get it started. Hello and good morning, Kai-Uwe. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, thank you so much, Christian, and uh, same to you. Uh, Kai-Uwe, first of all, I would like to uh, really uh, thank you very much uh, to do this presentation uh, today at our International Facade Summit. And uh, we both know each other since a couple of years. I actually cannot remember when we met first. But what I do remember is that I always tremendously enjoyed sitting together with you uh, and your team to talk about projects, opportunities and uh, innovations. And uh, uh, same, same here. I, I think we place a, a huge value on speaking to the manufacturers and really understanding how uh, the, the systems are working together and the, the whole process of actually uh, making these panels that are just right behind me, because that's uh, actually where we, uh, where we met. Yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, due to the fact that you, are, uh, that you are not able to talk live to us today, um, this conversation right now is a record, or is a recording. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you very much uh, that uh, uh, you will talk during your presentation about the Smile, uh, a project where we really enjoyed uh, to be a partner uh, of the project team. Um, it's uh, in Manhattan's district of uh, East Harlem, and in expense at the 126th Street. Uh, the product we see in the background actually is black knit stainless steel with a blast surface. And uh, yeah, the stage is yours. I'm looking forward to see your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a, actually a beautiful panel that picks up the sunlight in, in a really beautiful way. And uh, today I'm going to be speaking about uh, performative facades, um, how big things about facades as not only uh, providing a surface or uh, some form of, um, of finish or flourish, but really thinking about how facades can actually contribute either through energy uh, production or through um, other means of, of, of shielding sort of solar radiation and really thinking about how facades can really create a fine-tuned instrument. So I'm gonna uh, show through a series of projects, six in total, uh, where we're going to look at the Shenzhen Energy Mansion, uh, the VIA residences also here in New York, um, the Google Headquarter project, and then a, a deep dive into three very recent completions, the Audemars Piguet Museum in Switzerland, uh, the Smile, that is our collaboration right behind me, and uh, then also uh, concluding on uh, the ARC, uh, the Amar Waste to Energy Plan. Really looking forward to uh, presenting these projects to you. Okay. Um, Kai, in preparation of today, I learned that you became a partner at Bjarke Ingels Group in 2009, and you are overseeing and you are head of uh, Bjarke Ingels business development. And your team is currently working in over 
35 countries globally. Uh, please give me a, just a hint, how do you handle this during these current travel restrictions? Um, great question. We, I mean, we, we do actually have uh, a number of offices and just in the last 12 months, we've added two new offices, one in Shenzhen, China, and another one in Tokyo, Japan, uh, because uh, we realized that we should have uh, some people that are on the ground and, and closer to uh, overseeing the projects that we're doing and with Toyota Woven City and then also uh, work in China. So um, it is actually, uh, we've learned how to use the digital tools. Uh, we were using them before uh, COVID struck, but it certainly has now become a part of the DNA. And, um, and then it's the people, it's our staff, it's, the, it's everyone just pitching in and doing a tremendous effort to uh, both oversee uh, the projects and the clients that we of course are working on, but then also discovering new opportunities I think that any kind of crisis like this also uh, begins to uh, imagine uh, kind of new typologies, new ways of thinking and living. So we're also seeing um, work there. Great. Okay, Kai-Uwe, I know you are a little bit on a time pressure. Thank you very much again uh, for your contribution today. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, uh, to also enjoying everyone that is tuning in. I hear it's uh, a lot of people, so really happy to share our work uh, with you. Okay, and regards to the team and of course to Bjarke. Will do. Bye. Bye. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's uh, very exciting to be able to sort of speak about uh, Big's recent projects and specifically about our performative facades. Um, we really do look for ways in which the facades are actually not only providing shelter or providing cover, but also are actually in the process of creating performance uh, as we think about our projects. So I'm going to just begin by looking around the world uh, at our recently completed projects like the Shenzhen Energy HQ here uh, in a very sort of tropical Shenzhen uh, environment. And uh, if you look as you move around the uh, building, uh, it really opens up. And so uh, towards the north, it allows all of the indirect sunlight to come into the building. But then towards the south, it actually blocks through opaque facade elements, the, uh, the sort of natural heat uh, to come into the building. And that folding of the facade, almost like a Miyake uh, sort of dress, is really about uh, decreasing the heat gain in the building by actually 30%. And it is that sort of ability to sort of really think of this as almost a tropical modernism um, that is uh, taking a glass tower and now thinking about where it's being built and uh, thinking of how we can actually not just create glass towers uh, in all environments, but how does an, a commercial office building sort of uh, adapt to the climate of a tropical environment like Shenzhen? Similarly, here in New York, where I'm sitting now, uh, we completed the VIA residences, uh, also known as the court scraper uh, for, for combining a courtyard uh, with a high-rise skyscraper. And here the facade and the roof are actually one. And we've uh, kind of excavated or created these, carved out these sort of personal balconies uh, in the facade that you can sort of then also enjoy both the views and also uh, the spaces that are created with this landscape. And imagine living in the center of New York, uh, but looking out at this uh, sort of verdant and lush landscape. Um, and then also in the United States, of course, the Google headquarters is just finishing up. And uh, that's where uh, the sort of what you see here sort of draping uh, roofscape that also is very much uh, acting as a facade as well uh, is a performative uh, in terms of actually producing energy. This is a shingled photovoltaic really being utilized for the very first time uh, in a building and, and is allowing us to uh, really think and rethink about how 
uh, a facade and a roof can really become uh, a part of uh, answering the sort of call for sustainability and, and become a performative uh, uh, element. And uh, this is a building that will one day house actually 3,000 workers underneath this, this roof. And uh, it's, it's something that we're uh, very excited to bring to, uh, to the general public. But I wanted to really talk about three projects in uh, sort of specifics. And uh, this first project is Audemars Piguet, uh, a museum to watchmaking. And uh, what's really uh, wonderful when you consider uh, the history, and this is the last remaining uh, watchmaker uh, that is owned still privately, uh, and the sort of history of creating these watches out of uh, hundreds of different parts that are all within sort of tension uh, and uh, that are all related. And, and you have the glass encasement, you have sort of steel structure, you have springs. We wanted to sort of emulate uh, this in the actual design and concept of the museum. So the entire roof that you see right there in the, uh, in the concept uh, is actually held up by the curvature of the glazing. Um, and we're using very similar materials, brass, glass, uh, and a lot of uh, steel to uh, sort of, uh, you know, again, speak to the, the very quality. Uh, we also kind of played with the spiral and the, the sort of the, the tension that that also creates spatially and that you sort of come into the museum all the way into the center and then you uh, unravel and, and sort of head back out uh, and you get to see the people actually working on the watches. Um, and so here you can see how the roof is uh, under construction uh, and you can see how then we uh, sort of place that and embed it into the sort of existing uh, buildings. The, the building in the back is the original founder's house uh, that uh, is where the watches were first uh, uh, made. You can see the, the sort of floor heating that's integrated, uh, a lot of care taken, and you, you'll notice that there are no columns in, in, this, uh, in this space. Uh, this is entirely being held up by panes of glass, and I think it's very uh, interesting that you actually have um, up to five sheets of glass with laminate that are curved in order to take the, the, uh, the stresses and the weight uh, of the roof. And again, you have dynamic sort of loads, snow loads in this part of uh, Switzerland that you really have to uh, care about. And the other, the other uh, uh, thing that you have to sort of care about is actually the sun, because when you do uh, open everything up to a glazed uh, uh, sort of space, you have to then also think about the solar shading. So a very uh, carefully and, and handcrafted brass uh, brie soleil uh, was fabricated uh, by Frenner and Reifer uh, and then installed. And here the idea is really to uh, allow it to sort of disappear and go away as you look out from inside, but then it provides the protection uh, against the sort of direct sun uh, towards, uh, towards uh, from outside in. And here you can see a few of those construction photos and, and as it's becoming sort of realized, the roof, uh, the spaces, the spiral moving in and outward. And these are the sort of completed photographs uh, of the exhibition. And then also the watchmakers actually uh, uh, producing uh, the, the very timepieces that are in the exhibition. Um, and uh, also elements of this swinging door uh, in the facade so that you can make a, a really direct connection between inside and outside. So uh, we're really happy that the museum actually opened in the past year um, and right adjacent to it that you can see there on the left side is a, a hotel that will actually be uh, ski in, ski out. So this, uh, uh, this valley, this region, within Switzerland is very well known for cross-country skiing. And uh, you're gonna be able to sort of stay within this small village of watchmakers and see the watchmaking craft. And at the same time, enjoy all of the, the sort of landscapes around it. And that's again, a facade and a roof that really works by being able to be a habited, uh, inhabited and, and really have a very close connection between inside and outside. 
Um, we're going to now go to the Smile Residences, and that's a project that's here in New York. Um, which is a infill project. So not a corner project, but one that actually is in between a lot of different buildings. Um, and this is a metal uh, facade that we work together with, uh, with Pole, um, who uh, are in Germany. And this is really a beautifully treated metal panel uh, through uh, both chemical and also electromagnetic uh, uh, sort of treatments. Uh, to create and be able to sort of capture the light. And I think what is unique about this project as a kind of infill project is um, when you look at, you know, it was a parking lot behind a commercial project. And uh, typically, you know, you would be able to sort of create a bar building that is, uh, you know, double loaded. Uh, and um, we asked the client, if you own the commercial building, why not actually create a sort of T-shaped that would uh, increase the units uh, by, uh, by 30 or 33%. And then we also uh, looked at the code, uh, which of course in, in New York is often this sort of wedding cake uh, where the, the, the facade steps back. And in a hundred years since the evolution of the step back facade uh, kind of regulation, we actually asked the question that, um, could we actually, instead of stepping back at a certain height, could we not actually scallop the entire facade because it was a volume of space that is uh, the kind of stepping back rule? Uh, we then took the volume of that step back and we applied it to the entire facade. And so that is how you get the scallop shape of this building. And it really creates you know, a, a bar building down at the ground level, but then it becomes a T-shape and with the scallop uh, on the side for all of the sort of residential units that you see above. And the, uh, in a hundred years, the building department had never seen anyone interpret the uh, building regulations and the facade treatment in the same way. So um, even they were uh, in some ways perplexed but they had to allow this building because it actually did, uh, it, it did interpret uh, the code in, in the correct manner. So here you can see how those facade elements are applied and, and attached to a concrete substructure. Uh, you can also see the beautiful quality of these panels and how they capture different lights. Um, this is the T shape on the, on the, over the commercial side that you can see here and, and in, as completed, and really how the building now fits into the rest of, uh, of Harlem. Um, and the building is called the Smile because it takes on that curve that you see here. And then you enter into the uh, ground floor, uh, into the reception. The reception desk also is inspired by, uh, by the uh, building shape. Uh, you move into and through the uh, elevators into the curved corridors, and then, of course, into these beautifully light-filled apartments um, that uh, also uh, speak to both structurally how the building is actually performing. Um, and then a, a very, I, I think, uh, uh, incredible amenity package of, of saunas and salt baths and hammams uh, that uh, everyone can enjoy. So there's a a real emphasis on sort of uh, wellness and water uh, that you can see here also from the, from the rooftop pool looking out over the city of New York. And then in conclusion, the uh, recent completion of our waste to energy plant in Copenhagen, where um, you know, it's uh, taking an old uh, uh, power plant that you can see on the left side with the three smokestacks that is now being decommissioned and will be torn down. And it's being replaced by the, uh, the power plant that you see in the foreground that just finished. And we're talking about taking household waste uh, and turning that into, uh, you know, all of the household waste arrives into this plant. It's then uh, taken and uh, burned in the furnace. And then that supplies energy and heat uh, uh, and electricity for uh, all of the residents of Copenhagen. So of course it is a power plant first uh, and uh, we designed the power plant, but then we also considered what else could this fire pl uh, power plant be? And so we looked at uh, around at what 
you know, you have the uh, climate in Denmark like Scandinavia, so it does snow and it's very cold, uh, but of course it's very flat, so there are not a lot of mountains. Uh, so we thought about what would happen if you can actually uh, ski down the roof of this power plant. Um, the, the air that's coming out of the smokestack is actually now filtered and is clean enough so that you can actually go and, uh, and do this. And so um, suddenly what usually is a NIMBY project, I don't want to have a power plant in my backyard, became a YIMBY project. Yes, I want that ski slope in my backyard. And uh, suddenly a lot of people that would never talk about or care about a power plant suddenly are your biggest advocates. And you can see here also the facade treatment is uh, these steel sort of uh, boxes uh, that can take a curve. Uh, they can take, you know, of course, the, the large uh, uh, facade. They, like the pole uh, panels, also take on a lot of different uh, sort of uh, uh, qualities of light in the sky. Um, and there are a lot of other kind of, uh, not only skiing, but there's a, the tallest uh, climbing wall in Europe. Uh, you have uh, wander uh, paths and, and places for families to sort of walk up and enjoy the view. There's a, there's a cafe and a, uh, a bar at the top that people actually now come to, to go see and see the views out over this, their city that they've never really had the opportunity to enjoy. Um, it's also a workplace for uh, many workers that are actually a part of the, the power plant. So it's, it's wonderful how this sort of the facade treatment is actually used to frame views, to uh, provide shelter, to also celebrate this new amenity to Copenhagen. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much for, for joining. Great presentation. I mean, thanks uh, to Kai Uwe Bergman really giving us that chance to go into the details of the work of uh, Biaki English Group. And uh, I also got a little bit information from the homepage about this uh, architectural company. And uh, I guess you can really feel more or less the subline of that kind of activity. It is information driven design. This is the subline of BIG. And in addition, I can really just give you one recommendation. Just watch and go on the Biaki English group internet platform. It is very puzzling. It is disturbing at the very beginning when you go there because it is just as Lego bricks. Each project is Lego bricks on top of each other. But the shape is an icon. So for BIG, every project is an icon. And said this, I'm happy to introduce our second speaker because iconic building, expressive, sustainable and energy efficient, these are the four keywords for Saubo Hatten. I'm happy to just ask Juan Lucas Young to come to us in the forefront and give us the presentation about his works, about his activities for Saubo Hatten. Saubo Hatten, I guess most of the people hopefully know, was founded by Luisa Hatten and uh, Matthias Sauerbruch, 1989. And uh, Lucas, um, um, Juan Lucas, he joined more or less in 1990. He was a young, young fellow, 26 years old, he told me beforehand. And he already got one of the most impressive buildings in Germany, and he was part of this winning team. It is the GSW building in Berlin. This building, more or less, you might know when you are from Germany, it is 1990 when they have more or less uh, been awarded for that kind of project. It is in the east part of Berlin, one block away from Checkpoint Charlie. The facade, which is facing west, is more or less the convection facade, which is a double skin facade. And on the rooftop, it's a reminiscence, I thought, of the 50s of last century, is a big, big airplane wing. But in fact, the airplane wing is nothing else than supporting the natural ventilation of the building. So if nowadays architects want to build sustainable, go to Berlin, go and watch GSW. And uh, we have just spoken beforehand to have at 26, 27, 28, it starts a little bit later, but being younger than 30 years, a responsibility for a project of 185 million Deutschmark, similar amount of, of euros these days, is remarkable in the career and the activity of Juan Lucas. 
Um, furthermore, of course, a lot of projects just uh, popped out when I, I entered more or less the investigation on that one. It was KfW West Arkaden here in Frankfurt, awarded 2011 to be the best tall building in the world. Also remarkable, another icon for that activity. Uh, M8, M9, more or less uh, Venice Museum District. Then more or less is the Stockholm one which is also very, very interesting. I hope you have some, some information on that one as well. And I go back into Switzerland, because just under construction, one of the, for me at least, most thrilling project is Médecins Sans Frontières building in Geneva. Juan Lucas, great to have you here. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let's see if I get this right. Um, so, uh, my presentation is called Crafting Facades. If you are expecting a lot of detailed technical information about how we build them, uh, I'll be slightly disappointing you. I'll be talking a bit more about the artistic intentions, uh, the design inspiration, the process uh, that leads us to craft these facades. And uh, I started this uh, uh, I'm using for the presentation this title bit because when we start projects, we start them usually with a function sheet, you know, clients stress what they, they, they explain what they want to have, what they want to, functions they need, a program and so on. And in many times you don't even know where the client is standing. Is it like a, a sort of misunderstood traditionalist uh, thinking of classical architecture or they have big aims and they want to go all the way forward? So it's a challenge of uh, architects to reinterpret the, the place, which is a subtitle of this um, conference called uh, Mastering the Complexity of Place, which is from where we draw a lot of our inspiration. So um, this way. So we are based in Berlin, as has been explained. We are a large office in the meantime. We were originally from London. We, I, met, I went from Buenos Aires to London, where I met Luis and Matthias. We met there and we won the competition for the GSW, which is where I will start my, my presentation in a minute. Uh, but we moved to, to Berlin in 93. Uh, we kept London running a little bit, but uh, we eventually focused in Berlin. So you could say that as an office, we are a bit of a hybrid, a British-German hybrid, uh, which has a lot to say about the way we think and, and do our architecture. I will start maybe with this uh, project that you said has been mentioned because it's a project uh, that not only still remains uh, attached to my heart and very special, but, but also because it uh, summarizes the, very nicely, very well, the process that we have about going about architecture and how we approach our projects, which is, of course, with the research about the story, the history of the place. So we, we, we try to understand the traces of that past, how, how things developed here, the Friedrichstadt in Berlin, that how it densified, it became its Baroque origins, destroyed by the war, eventually after the war, the thinking of the car city and the division, the east and west, how that all sort of starting to develop. And um, these sort of traces of the past are very, very important for us. And in that way, when we are tracing that past, we're also thinking of alternatives, of the process of design in the first stage of the competition, that GSW Tower looked really different. And eventually, it, it did change in the, in the second phase. So all this process of design, is, um, which is inspired by the place, and, and it's a, a playing of, of many, many layers of information, of ideas, finds ultimately a synthesis uh, in, in maybe drawings like this that I will show you some more. And here in this project, we are trying, as you can see, pick up the traces of the past and, and render a really bold response. Um, here, for instance, picking up the, the, the traces between the gray zone, the, the wall where you had the east and western divide. Now, the projects um, also have this layer of innovation, of in integration of, in this case, nat natural ventilation concepts you were mentioning, the cross ventilation from the east to the west side. Um, we're also introducing other issues like uh, exposed concrete and, and daylight uh, coming into the space. So all these sort of um, 
layer out of, out of layer of innovation of thinking of low energy consumption which we learned a lot working with our English counterparts in the early 90s and that's widespread in Germany much later uh, in, in a fantastic way all this is condensed in, a, in the expression of a building I mean the composition of a building is a result of all these traces of all this thinking and you could actually trace this in many of our projects, in many of these uh, early projects as well, which um, are um, placed in very different cities from Dessau in the east and the west, and, and all those, um, all those uh, features, all those ideas, all this urban approach, which manifests itself eventually in the facade, can be condensed in these little drawings. Um, these early projects of, of us, um, the GSW, for instance, with its uh, use of color, but also the use of glass. The, the same goes for the photonic syndrome in, in, uh, in Adlershof. You can see that from early on we were interested in very different things, materials like glass, like ceramic, like uh, brick, like metal. Um, brick here in the extension of the Umweltbundesamt in the Wölitzer Bahnhof, which was built for um, the Expo, so it doesn't was just a pilot project for the Umweltbundesamt where we started working with timber and glass color in alternation. At the time, working with timber in Germany was almost impossible above two stories, and this is another interesting aspect of, of, um, um, of innovation is that you can push, help push the boundaries uh, quite, quite a way up. And um, finally, the Museum Brandhaus, where we started experimenting with, with, um, with ceramics. So you can see that there's an array from early on and interest in very different kind of materials. And all of these materials, um, say with the glass, um, we, we experiment the, the, the sort of the first projects where we started working with color, but color was applied maybe on the concrete or on the metal louvers, but not necessarily on the glass. Then we discovered that we could work with the glass uh, as a printed glass, uh, using it as some protection, movable, then we change it to horizontal or vertical elements as well, printing it in, in, the, in the bands. I mean, this, this sort of... Um, Many, many uh, different ways of treating the glass where, for instance, it became uh, in, in some projects like the KfW that you just mentioned. This was a project which has a huge amount of innovation the way it was with the natural ventilation. We work a lot with hybrid buildings, mechanical natural ventilation, or in the ADSC tower. They have components in the facades that allow this, this hybrid ventilation. Uh, the same goes for for uh, Sheffield building where the, the natural ventilation is is, is fostered by, um, by by chimneys um, thermal chimneys in the facade so glass has been used as passive elements uh, and also for the plasticity of buildings so to to uh, in this case for Munich uh, where we were um, um, reconstructing the facade integrating all existing structure where they had you had staircases that needed to be integrated in the facade and and the plasticity of glass is uh, something which offers many, many alternatives, many, many ways of, um, of implementing. The same goes for ceramic, um, which was a material we discovered during the Brandhaus facade. And we, um, we, we in, in many projects like, like this one in, in, in Hamburg for the federal agency, of uh, the environment and, and urbanism, we combine it with concrete um, interior spaces, the same combination you can find many, many years later in, um, in the Mestre Museum that we did uh, recently, where ceramic uh, played a huge role in the cladding of the facade uh, and, and uh, interior spaces as well, where you can, you can still see through uh, the opening of the landscape staircase leading to the exhibition spaces, the, the dialogue between the concrete and the ceramic. Timber, uh, which I mentioned already, was the material we discovered uh, during our Umweltbundesamt, uh, can also be not only uh, used for, um, for just the cladding purposes of it, which, I mean, timber we all know is an amazing material because of uh, the fact that it can be grown uh, all the time and is a, a resource that you know is endless in a way but also we, timber we we treat it as a constructive element so in this uh, prefabricated elements that also build not only the structure of the building but also um, determine the space and they have the plasticity they they tell us a lot about the the, the plasticity of this of the space 
the, the student housing here in Hamburg, uh, Woody, um, is a project which, uh, in the first um, impression you, you win about it, is the, the, wood, the timber cladding, but actually is a timber module completely prefabricated that was toppled on top of each other, and, and that's uh, the way uh, the building was uh, generated. And uh, you were mentioning Médicin Sans Frontières. This is a building which is now under construction where the facade is, uh, is uh, made out of big frames of timber which have different depths, uh, depending if they have a balcony or if they don't. And they are actually sometimes framing two or three stories depending on the, the, the spatial composition of the space inside this very flexible institution, uh, an amazing institution, Médicin Sans Frontières, when you get to know it. But also timber, um, we... We went further, uh, um, there was a, a project which we did, uh, uh, the Haga Forum in Aubernay, where we worked with a timber roof, but a metal facade, and where you can see already that from, I mean, people tend to associate our buildings a lot with color, which is an important issue, and I will come to that later, but um, like in the church, we also work just with the materials themselves, which with their texture and the materiality make the expression of the buildings. In this case, the combination of metal and, um, and timber are uh, giving all the expression to the building. This was a building which is, I think, probably the first really, really grid uh, orientated. Uh, the stringency of the grid of three by three meter grid of the building was very, very important. And we, um, we contrasted it with um, metal cladding of the facade, which is, um, sub is, is based on the grid of 150, 1960. And the, the treatment of those, um, of those elements of metal is threefold. We have sort of highly reflective, high, matte elements and grooved elements so that the, the, the plasticity of the facade and how, how it's uh, reflecting light and how it's uh, breaking the mass of the building is, uh, is um, yeah, very, very special. In this uh, school extension we did in Berlin, which is just finished, uh, it's the other way around. The, the timber is bringing all the structural framing for the, for the extension in the roof which we had no other alternative because they were a DDR plattenbaut that it could not hold any other kind of structure, would be too heavy. So we, we conceived a structure for the extension out of timber and the metal is cladding all this, um, all this structure and also mingling very nicely with the existing um, facade. But metal can also be a very industrial product, like for the Gira in Rade von Wald, we took a very simple LM panels and we conceived a, a facade of the repetition and alternating color to, to make it work in this otherwise very idyllic uh, um, Landstraße, how you say, um, um, sort of country roadside. Um, but from, say, a very robust industrial product, it can also be metal, can be a very sophisticated, elegant um, uh, material, like in this case for a Baugruppenprojekt in Berlin. It's a stainless steel facade, made, uh, which is um, wobbly in, 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 in that it's also allowing, it's very nice, um, I think if you see the previous picture, you can see how it mingles into the sky and, and loses the mass of the, of the building. It lightens itself and also by its wobbliness it's, and, and reflecting the opposite buildings also helps to dematerialize the building. This was a very important effect we wanted to achieve. Brick, we used it not only in the traditional way, but we also like to use it like as a noble material in this noble quarter for this housing uh, villa and working villa in, in um, English and garden but also in combination with glass for the balconies in uh, Helsinki or in its very traditional pure uh, but plastic way for this hotel in Lübeck that we won a competition but we don't know if with COVID what will happen with hotels nowadays. Well, we are still optimistic. I think people will start traveling soon again. Um, and the last, <coughs> sorry, the last big material could never be missing is plaster. Plaster, as a matter of fact, is mineralische plaster. Sorry for the German, for the international audience, but not as a, a composite. And this is a material which also uh, we like a lot, and it's um, one which, if it's properly, properly built, properly done, it, is, it offers other. You know, it, it's, it transmits a sense of tectonicity and, and, and one single volume in a way that other materials that you work with joints don't have. Here for another building uh, in 
<coughs> in Berlin, which is a housing and living uh, bau project of Alton combined with concrete, or in the convent in Mestre, <coughs> there's uh, the new museum which I showed, this ceramic and, and, and concrete, but there's also a convent which had to be converted and we which we, in the courtyard of this convent, we placed a very light construction. So here you have another material which is like membranes. <coughs> and um, so plaster is, as I say, also a very interesting material for us. As you can see, we love all materials. We, we, we work with all of them very uh, comfortably and, and we don't have a particular sort of um, inclination for one or the other, but it's out of the essence of the place and it's that we try to discover which is the right answer. And these drawings show <coughs> that, I'll, I'll go through a chapter now of drawings, so I'll, I'll be out of, of photos of realized big things and, and go back to the world of abstraction. Because it's with drawings that we start um, to focus in the architecture we're doing, in the thinking behind the buildings, in, in trying to summarize in the building the main ideas of a, of, a, of a project, like this competition drawing for the GSW Tower. You can see there was no color, there was no, uh, but you can see the texture, you can see the idea, the, the, the proportion of the facades and how it relates to the, to the place. And in the photonic centrum, for instance, we, we wanted to apply the color to the concrete columns and to the sun protection to dematerialize the column, the, the, the heaviness of it, and for it to become much lighter. Also understanding how the roof in the experimental fabric in Magdeburg could become a flying sort of uh, element that would uh, mingle facades and roofs and let the building hover over the place, or the inspiration in our um, <coughs> Uh, laboratory building in, in Biberach, where the facade is um, made out of glass and inspired in, the, uh, uh, in, in blowing up a, a cell, you know, and so the, the pattern of the cell is the one that conceived the, the facade. Now, in our building in Dessau, I think I was talking today um, about it, the, the, the color inspiration, I mean, it's a, it's a timber facade, um, and uh, this uh, alternated with glass, and the color of this building is inspired really by the surroundings. So it has a side addressing a park, which we created, and another side addressing the existing um, um, neighboring buildings, which are mostly in brick. So the color of the buildings are mainly green and, and, and reds. Um, now to this building, which is very long and very curvy and very difficult to grasp in one go, was also not only for the public difficult to grasp, but for us to design the color so difficult that we had to build a 1 to 50 model and do huge elevations. And you can start seeing another issue about our, our process work, which is the iteration process. So we had to do, you see lots of samples in the background, you see drawings in the world, you can imagine how many of those were needed. And all of those colors had to be put in this model for us to slowly be designing um, the, the project. Now, timber in this particular project was uh, an element, uh, a material which was hard to get and was um, closely monitored by the state. It um, was a fascinating process I was discussing uh, this morning about, but at the time it was very stressful. Um, for instance, we were fighting very hard to get the timber um, bands integrated in the project, and, and there were sort of three components that we had to consider, the economy, the ecology, which were like plaster and... Um, and wood was sort of close to each other, but when it came to the social uh, component of it, how people would like it, how people would appreciate it, also uh, it, it, it helped tipping the, tipping the discussion. So you could see that the economy and the ecology were not that far away from each other. Now this timber facade, which was not only the cladding of the building, but also the panels of the building were made in timber, and the, and the insulation was made of cellulose, so everything was timber. Um, uh, and the color that you see is an alternation of window, uh, of, of walls and, and natural ventilation uh, for the night cooling um, elements. So again, these technical aspects of a facade which so, so effortless appear in the elevation have um, is something which you go crafting. That's why the title of the, the presentation, Crafting Facades, you go crafting very slowly. It's something you, 
you, it takes a long process, a long while to, to go from the big image to the abstract drawing into the, into the final product. The same goes for the Frankfurt facade, um, which um, is, is applying color to the flaps that open. And, and this zigzag that you see in plan, you need it not only to integrate the, the flaps, but also to break the sound transmission in the double facade and break the telephony effect that you might have there. So there is a technical idea that transforms into a, into a design idea. The same goes for our Sheffield building with those chimneys and how the, 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 the building is in a very polluted uh, the corner of town with a lot of traffic and we had to allow for natural ventilation but, but let sound out. So there is a whole complex system of labyrinthic system or the same goes for the ADSC facade where we had to integrate volume, um, as a, how you call them, Volumstromregler, it's a, like a, a system uh, that allows air to enter with a certain pressure into the space. So you don't get drafts into, the, into, the, into your building and integrate some protection and so on. Like in the case, <coughs> in many of these projects, there are infinite variations of how you can integrate the same idea and we, it took us forever to come to the right uh, solution for this uh, particular project. The Brandhaus uh, facade is maybe also an interesting story because we won the competition with this drawing, which is, uh, um, is showing on the one hand that we broke the mass of this building into three volumes that we are uh, in the composition. But you can also see is that it was a glass facade with a double layer. Um, so the, f the front, uh, the back layer was a, min uh, a sort of opaque layer and the front layer was made of glass with with um, printed glass, and we wanted to work with a double, with the depth of it. Now, what we did not think at the time, and none, no other participant thought either, was that there was a, an indication by the planning authorities that this building should be absorbing noise. We didn't, no, none of us paid attention. It, it, it didn't say that it should absorb noise. It said that it should not be enhancing reflection of noise to the neighboring residential area. So that was a problem because glass and any other material that does not absorb noise is reflecting noise. And <clears throat> so we had to, after the initial shock of how do we deal with it, we thought, oh, okay, let's, let's see what happens. And we started studying any sort of ways into which we could um, create layers uh, that would be uh, we keep keeping the idea of the two layers, but changing from glass into metal or into other materials, and slowly but surely also patterns should be holes, should be bars. And we discovered that <clears throat> we hung them outside this, the, the office and we started discovering that also added the second issue of the shadows, which was very interesting. And um, we slowly came to the conclusion that, for instance, the, the, the bars was a very interesting alternative. And then we discovered that it could be uh, a bar which could be weaved, the, the weave could be done in ceramic. Then we realized, oh, it looks awful. Um, it, I think it does look awful. Uh, but we liked the, the ceramic. We discovered the ceramic transmitted exactly the, the, the quality of the materiality we wanted. And then we went for this sort of uh, folded box facade, <coughs> which was a perforated metal absorbing the noise, and the noise went through the bars. And we had, of course, millions of different um, studies of uh, this color until we came to the proper family of, of, of three families of colors for the three volumes we wanted to achieve. And um, now with color, as you can see with these paintings of Albers, you can achieve many things, among, among them depth. Depth uh, and, and also, <coughs> you know, color uh, mixes. Uh, so it could, depending, to, to, to achieve this effect of the mixing of the color, um, we, there is, closeness and, 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 and far away. So if you are close, you will get this perception, the, the detailed perception of the individual color. If you are far away, you are getting the mix. And this was uh, the concept that led us to the, the thinking, is the thinking behind, the crafting behind the Brandhaus facade that I just showed you. Now, a, a, a facade can be also a dress. Like in the Sheffield, we, we did this installation for, um, for, for, for Venice. Uh, but it's, you know, it's made out of, of very solid elements, you know, ceramic or glass or, or elements like that. Or, or, or a facade can be inspired by the velocity of the train running by, like the site of the Hamburg building. And so, or in others, you, you, you might be looking for kinetic effects. We were breaking the facade and applying color 
to its reveals and achieving an ever-changing facade uh, building depending from where you came and how you saw it. A, an, a concept that we also applied in a different way but similar to the Munich uh, extension for Munich Ray where <clears throat> we applied colors, different families of colors and so depending from where you came, the same facade, you could see it in two different colors if you came from the right or you came from the west. Again, we had to do a facade, um, a model to, to really understand that. And in some cases, we are trying to, of course, to, to reduce to the bare minimum the main principles of, uh, of a building. So drawings we're using to, to summarize as much as we can the, the essence of a building, what really interests us in, in a building. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm finishing more or less this chapter now with um, the brick facade for um, uh, this villa in, in Munich we did. Because uh, you can see on the floor, <coughs> of this photo, the, the brick, which was particularly shaped and, and designed for, for this building, because we wanted the brick facade, but we wanted to have these points of color coming into this, so uh, to achieve a certain level of plasticity. Now, this, um, we had to do a mock-up to make sure that this could work, how they would be built, and how the color could be applied. But the design of the, of the color, the design of all the facade was built, was finally done in a model. There was no other way to do it but to build a huge model and it was hand-painted, really crafted. For weeks on end, uh, our team uh, was working and finally when it was all finished, um, we had to put it outside to see the colors in daylight. There was no other way that, I mean, there's a problem of, of, of judging colors between um, electrical or, or daylight. And drawings can be uh, sometimes just there to, again, summarize an idea or use it to explain a client how the whole thing works, like the extension of the school. Or in this way to have, is, is a, a drawing summarizing the whole urban idea of the project. This is the Mestre, where we are showing how we are connecting the two, the, 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 the spatial connection uh, across the, the convent and the new museum. Um, again, picking the inspiration of the color treatment of the ceramic on the surroundings and doing dozens of drawings uh, that to study the composition of each individual color that, believe me, has a drawing and a position of each individual tie, uh, goes through this very long process uh, of, of crafting them, of identifying the color, of, 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 of doing dozens of, of these drawings. So what you're seeing here is, oh, I don't know, like 15 or 16 different combinations of color. <coughs> Sorry for this coughing. Um, so I will now, based on this very, sorry for being so fast, uh, I can take talk for hours about the, the, the essence and the approach and the process of our work. But I thought it was interesting maybe to show you this little intro, or this introduction and I will now focus on two projects to show you a little bit, um, in a little bit more depth, uh, some, you know, the process of design of these two projects, which you can maybe associate with what I've been talking about so far. Um, this is the Experimenta in Heilbronn, which is a science center in a fantastic location at the heart of the city in an island. And as an island, the building has no front and no back. I mean, it just offered the possibility of opening to all sides. Uh, the planning uh, restrictions meant that we had to keep a distance between the existing and the new build. We could not build next to it. We had to keep this gap, which meant that the buildings had to be uh, connected underground and in the ground floor. Uh, you can see here how you just through this sequence of bridges go to the old uh, part of town and ha holds the more public figures. Now, the... Um, we had to conceive an exhibition area, uh, which we decided to break into four floors to fit into the, the bow fence that, you, that we had, to, the, the place that we had available to construct. And the brief uh, required a so-called um, um, space-time spiral that should be connecting all the exhibitions. And you can see the green uh, boxes are the exhibition areas and the spiral is linking them all up. And the idea of creating these this pentagons that were rotating had to do that two-thirds of the plan was exhibition space and one-third was sort of circulation. And by, by, by connecting one to each other meant that, the, that automatically these pentagons would be rotating. There were two more um, elements, uh, sorry. 
One was the workshops that hang in the middle of the building through an atrium space and a huge 360-degree uh, theater. So here you can see the relationship of the exhibition and the uh, circulation area. And the images that we created at the time of the competition, which were, uh, if you like, uh, futuristic or uh, they had a connotation of, of science, uh, which is actually the, the, the purpose of this building, is to educate school classes and families about the world of science. Actually a fantastic program, um, which is also putting Heilbronn in the, in the, in the map. Now, <clears throat> when we started working about the facade and we tried to develop this facade, we realized that it was not that easy because um, we didn't like too much the idea of, of splitting the facade into a, a primary facade and a cladding facade, which would be not only a problem for the um, maintenance and cleaning and all that stuff, but also we were not in, so sure that we were creating that greater space behind. Plus, <clears throat> we had the issue of the structure, which at the time of the competition, we conceived a truss to take on these rotating elements in the in the uh, circulation space. When we thought, what happens if we, if we change that? If we, if we put, uh, we're also finding that we had tr tr trouble making it structurally work. And so we, we, we decided to change the principle and put the trusses in, in, the, in the opaque elements, in the exhibition areas, and liberate the uh, circulation area from, from the trusses, as you can see in these uh, renderings, which also meant <clears throat> that it was much easier to to manage to the structure. <clears throat> Again, we, we still started, we're, we're still on the trip of getting it to work with the idea of this sort of filigran, uh, filigree uh, facade uh, treatment, but then we discovered that even then we are not very happy of the, of the spatial situation. And then we discovered, or we, we had the intuition that maybe we could work with the truss, with the structure. The structure could be the one leading that is the design of the building. And, 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 and we started working with triangular fields from the structure, uh, some of them being translucent, some of them being transparent, some of them being opaque. And you can see that how the, that these studies led to a certain level of translucency of the facade, which we find fascinating. Now we again build a model to understand all the structure and how there's only four columns going through. The rest you can see here that the truss is, um, is the one taking the structure and the circulation is hanging from it, which also meant that we could have very filigree structural elements. And all this was studied in um, a, a model uh, that went even one-to-one, -one, and there were sort of, um, of course, st spatial studies of the spaces, uh, the main spaces of the exhibition and the circulation area. The result, you can see, if you go to Heilbronn, is this sort of ever-changing and also changing in terms of its uh, translucent and transparent elements. You can see the roof, which is a fifth facade with the observatory and the reflection of the old Speicher building, which is very, very beautiful. And um, this, uh, there were a lot of discussions about how much daylight the, the, the space should be allowing and how rough it should be. And, but the other um, the interesting element of this, um, of this project, which is, in a, if you like, a facade inside the facade or a building inside a building, was these workshops that I was mentioning earlier. Yes, thank you. Uh, some water would not <laughs> be bad. Um, um, these workshops, we, we, we understood them as being a very light, playful structure hanging in this atrium. And um, we, ex we experimented quite a lot on the, about the form and the spirit of it, about the cladding, should it be transparent, should it be opaque, should it have some light? I mean, how can you articulate this, this element to be as light as possible? And out of many, many iterations, the one on the bottom right that you can see is uh, the one where it all, all of us under glass took the upper hand. And we discovered that by by hanging half of the, of the structure uh, from, from the slab and, and letting the other half sitting, we could achieve, which, would, which could have the profiles, the, pro, the dimension of the profiles, and create a very uh, offset of the, of the building. And we also went for a, a, a full six meter tall um, uh, glass element, each floor is six meters, 
um, and because we wanted to avoid the, 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 the division of the, of the glass at the three meter height. Now this is a very tight space, so it had to be very carefully planned for it to work and to you know, show that we could replace windows, etc., etc. And this is the, the, the final study of, of uh, the final rendering of this, of this uh, um, uh, workshop. Now, these are f pictures, so the, the, the last component of it was a, a printing of the glass that we did to avoid um, the, 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 the observer perceiving the slab behind it. And we wanted to achieve this sort of if, uh, not clear sort of uh, understanding of the structure of how this thing worked. Uh, we wanted it to be as playful and as slight and offset from the floor, as you can see in this next picture. So it's, it's within the floor, it has two, two, two sort of sides. And, um, and this, this is uh, the, the, the spirit of this building, which is building upon this translucency about this lightness and the treatment of the soffit of the spiral space at night comes, or at dusk, uh, even more and more in the shine. And I will finish this presentation with a project which there is a collaboration with Vicona as well, uh, uh, as has been in a few of the projects I've shown already. Uh, this is a tower in Stockholm we, we, we did, and again, as in the previous scheme, uh, Experimenta, there was a change in the facade. Here you will also see a surprise. Originally, this is a, a, a building in, in a sort of axis of the city where there is a number of high-rise buildings. And <clears throat> the, um, this is the setup, so it's a very nice, newly dense uh, um, urban condition here in Hammarby. Now, the original master plan for this uh, building, which you can see in the bottom drawing, was a linear uh, um, urban situation. And the competition we took part was asking us to take a new view on this master plan. And we thought that this, uh, the point where the high rise had to be was not working well. It was not, there was another big issue is that the two streets tangent to the high rise are 16 meters apart. There is a street on the top and a street on the bottom and they're 16 meters apart. So the high rise was sort of very uncomfortable sitting in the place and the, this very narrow urban situation did not work. So we decided to extend the lines, cut it, the high rise loose and alternate the shaping of that. Originally in the competition, this was a curved facade. And so we resolved it as a curved building, which was <coughs> because the, <coughs> the footprint of the site was so, so tight and uh, at uh, 60 meters below, um, we, but we wanted to create a building that would go growing up from this very tight, uh, this very tight um, site. And this is the result of the original competition. So we, we had it in a curved facade and we thought it was very exciting because we could play with the idea of the outer treatment of the glass, which was not curved, it would be impossible to pay, but it was polygonal, and we liked the idea of how the reflection would be working. Now, the client said to us, it's all very nice, but it's, uh, you're, you're needing too many different modules, it's, it's not feasible, we cannot pay it. And we were at the brink of having to stop the project, uh, and, but they said, if you could come with a different idea that makes it work, uh, then we are happy to do it. And we came to the, the conclusion that if we straightened the, the sides rather than making it a curve, we could, we ultimately only needed four, four modules and all the other, we have uh, eight different conditions for the corners and that's all. So we, we achieved an amazing um, rationality of the whole building and, uh, and you can see here how the, 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 the smaller plants become, have on the narrow side a wider facade that as the building goes growing, the facade gets thinner. Here you can see the two lobbies on the top and the lower level. And um, I'll go quickly through the plans. You can see how the building slowly starts growing. And the facade, um, in a way, um, is built out of repetitive, repetitive elements that only change the color. So we, in the blue side, which is the wider facade, which is knicked, we treat it with two different blues to exacerbate the, that knick. But on the narrow facades, we treated it with with the red, and there is a golden reveal which is unifying all facades. Now, this is the, the study of the, all those elevations, and you can see the landscape staircase going down on, the, on one of the images. 
Um, but of course, in the beginning, for a long time, we had the colors reverted, and the blue and the red were, um, were different. But we realized that the other composition worked much, much better. And this is a building where uh, the facade is also coming, in, when it comes to the main lobby on the, on the ground floor, it's also shifting inside and it's defining the, the architecture of the lobby composition. So this project went through, of course, a number of, of studies, of rendering, so we have to prove the city that it works. Here you see very nice how the narrowness of the ground floor and the difference in height is like the building grows out of this narrow situation. And the study, the renderings for this facade turning in, so inside to, um, to define the, the lobby. Again, we did a one-to-one -one, uh, mock-up with a fantastic firma Lutania, um, also with the collaboration of Icona that were very helpful in this phase of the project. You can see the golden reveals that are tying the two color families. And I will finish uh, this presentation just with a few photographs <clears throat> showing the finished building, how it's different perception of it in the city, uh, depending from where you see it, changes all the time, de de depends, you know, if it's next to, um, to other buildings or, or the distance, or if it's hitting the hill uh, with the green um, and so on. It's, it's a fascinating, ever-changing perspective and, and, and appearance of this building, which we, we, we like very much. And uh, surprises has been, become now already seen in a few adverts and, and, and video clips and things in, in, in Stockholm. So, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was it. Juan Lucas, I mean, it's great to have someone here. And honestly, I, I was just going to hear on that place with the question, do we dare? Is architecture something we should really dare to? And my question was, is the audience willing to dare to clap their hands? Because it was a fantastic insight into Saul Bruchatten and your personal work on that one. When, when it comes more or less to architecture, uh, materiality, as well as the color is important to Saul Bruchatten. Why do you spend so much time on composing colors? <laughs> yeah, because it's more difficult than you think. I mean, one phase uh, we do not like is when we have to uh, imagine you're, you're, um, you come to a design point mm -hmm. and you know you're going to be applying color. And clients tend to, um, to judge what they see. What they see is what they get. It's difficult for them to sort of project on what they see. And, and just because you decide they're going to be applying color doesn't mean that the first iteration you do is working. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of iterations. Uh, for, for, it's like when you're crafting a plan as well. Not, not the first drawing you did mm -hmm. is hitting all the proportions right. The same goes to color. It's a, it's a lengthy process and you go discovering things as you go along and then eventually you also get the opinion of a client says, I like it, I didn't like mm -hmm. it and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very complex process. Uh, it usually takes um, a lot of work and in some cases we are working now in a project which I didn't show uh, where we are working with a ceramic band horizontal uh, mm -hmm. in a high-rise mm -hmm. uh, horizontal um, um, cladding for, for sun protection, mm -hmm. which we are alternating with vertical um, uh, mullions outside. <clears throat> and it's creating a mesh, and depending from where you see mm -hmm. it, it's changing the color. Mm -hmm. It's very complex to, to, to conceive, and it's very complex to transmit, to explain, to show, and we probably, again, we'll have to do a, build, a, a model, mm -hmm. because the only way we will be able to, <laughs> to design it ourselves. So it uh, depends a bit on the project, and yeah. depends a bit on the way you can perceive it, but it's um, a lot of work. Yeah, and when I see these different projects, I mean, not, none is the same as the other, so everything is bespoke. Um, how much important is craftsmanship in that sense, also for, for, the, for the companies involved into that kind of projects? Yeah. <clears throat> well, we, we have a workshop. We have yeah. one full floor of our offices dedicated to our workshop, run by an amazing York, an amazing model maker, and Denise as well, who's supporting him. And so one way we have is a lot of, of it is done mm -hmm. there, down there. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they are amazing in, in the way they can craft and, and produce mm -hmm. 
part elements, part models that where we can study all, many, many of these things. I mean, one day, I think one should do a lecture about just the parts they yeah, do, yeah. because it would be fascinating for you to see. But I, when I do tours of the office, I like taking clients or, yeah. or collaborators or consultants to the workshop, because it's where you understand yeah. quite a bit of how we work. Interesting. Last question from my side. I mean, craftsmanship models your answer properly. How much art is in architecture? Well, a lot, I think. I think we are, we were discussing today, I think we as architects have, of course, the obligation of being, you know, of being at the high, you know, state of the art of everything, mm -hmm. you know, of, of regulations, of products, of materials, of, of sustainability, of energy, of everything. I think we, you know, everything we do as a building has to be, is, is a lot of technique, mm -hmm. yeah? But if you don't have the poetry and the inspiration and the sensuality of buildings where we pass by and look and we like them, mm -hmm. or we work on them and we appreciate the space we're in, and if we don't manage to create that beauty of buildings, then as architects we are missing, I think, our main aim. Uh, so it, the, the challenge of architects, I think, is to combine, of course, the two things. That's why for what we understand as being something beautiful or something yeah. fantastic to experience, we spend a, a lot of time it's and effort in so. But we try to, of course, make all the technical parts, we, we assume our responsibility towards the user and towards society at large of creating sustainable mm -hmm. buildings. I did not go at very much into that part of the presentation today because it would um, be too large, but I mean, I meant I showed a mm -hmm. few a few points here and there, but you know, be aware, uh, be reassured that it's something which we put a lot of effort into it too. But ultimately, we want to create be beautiful buildings. Beautiful buildings. Juan Luca, thank you so much for being with us, joining us more or less today, and uh, also for the audience out there. Thank you so much, and please once more. Yeah, thank you. There, just do it. Okay. Art and architecture, I mean, this is more or less my bridge to the next the third presenter in a row and also a lecturer. He studied at the University of Fine Arts in Hamburg. And um, it was very interesting to get more or less his vita a little bit into the details. It is Peter Olbert from Hadi Teherani. Um, Peter, just join in. Peter here studied at that Fine Art University. Um, in addition, beforehand, he also studied at the University of Vienna. Um, interesting as such, I mean, I also grew up in the 90s, I must say, from an architectural point of view, Bote Richter Teherani was one of the icons besides Saubruch Hatten. He has been six years with Bote Richter Teherani before he said, ah, I do my own thing. So he started 15 years to do his own architectural company. And within these 15 years, I'm pretty sure Hadi Teherani was more or less hunting you like crazy to get on the track and to really get you back again on the Hadi Tehrani stuff. Now we get some technical support from Christian. Maybe also Christian just, just to focus on him. I mean, where, where's the camera? Just focus on Christian so that you can show him the mastermind behind the next studio. I mean, it should also be a little bit broadcasted today. Furthermore, of course, I mean, when it comes to Hadi Tehrani, I also Googled a little bit into the Evita of it. I mean, I said it beforehand, uh, Peter is also part of the Preservation Monument and Building Preservation uh, Council in Hamburg. And uh, out of this, I expect a lot from his presentation because we have a lot of good buildings in Germany. But the question is, when refurbishment, when revitalization is coming, is it destroying the original spirit? Hadi Tehrani has as one of his aims, charismatic buildings must be built in his subline of the architectural part. So how much preservation is just maintaining the status quo. Homeland protection was one of the words you gave me instead of developing revitalization and developing uh, things further. Um, you will give us hopefully some insights into the Deutschland House in Hamburg. Um, I mean, really well located in Hamburg where it's really traditional buildings around. Looking forward how you solve that kind of more or less spagat, this kind of tension field when it comes to that kind of activity. Furthermore, of course, here in Frankfurt, very, very famous high-rise buildings are just under construction. You will show us hopefully something about the spin um, and hear a little bit about your ideas about verticality, about horizontal uh, aspects, but also 
how much solitaire a high-rise should be and how much embedded in urban context it must be. So more or less, these are the activities around. Peter, just grab your, your glass of water, um, lead us through this kind of presentation. And the last project, of course, I Googled as well, because it must be mentioned in that uh, context as well, is uh, Mercator One in Duisburg, one of the first building, if not the first building in Germany, with an end-of-life aluminum material, just trying to press down the carbon footprint in our industry. Peter, the floor is yours. Looking forward to your lecture. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for the pl pleasant introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here today at the next summit uh, because uh, I have the opportunity to uh, already saw a lot of very intriguing projects um, uh, in, the, in the former presentation. Uh, today I will introduce you to uh, two high-rise buildings in Germany uh, that are planned by Hardy Tehrani architects and uh, they are currently under construction so I uh, only will focus on that two projects. Um, strictly speaking one of the projects is uh, uh, only a high-rise uh, due to the uh, building law. Uh, it is part of a perimeter development um, and uh, surpass the German high-rise border by 22 meters. Um, uh, f uh, the German high-rise border is 22 meters and it uh, uh, surpasses it by 18 meters. Um, uh, what is meant is the Deutschlandhaus and uh, the second building I want to introduce is um, uh, um, is uh, I try to first yeah. um, the second building I want to introduce is um, uh, um, also rises uh, from the uh, perimeter of the block. Um, you can already uh, call it a skyscraper because it, um, uh, due to its uh, height of more than 100 meters. Um, uh, it's about the spin tower in Frankfurt. Uh, both projects emerged uh, from competitions uh, as winners in uh, 2017. Uh, both projects um, are characterized by the fact uh, that they are um, um, shaped by the, uh, by the urban uh, environment and by the city's history. And, uh, however, they are, um, uh, they are uh, have very different concepts. Um, while one of the building uh, designs relates to the uh, city that has grown over time and uh, to the uh, uh, guiding principles of critical uh, reconstruction. The second design is subject to the modern urban redevelopment and it's uh, affected by the conversion of former industrial areas. Let's start uh, with a project, uh, the Spin Tower in Frankfurt. The uh, Spin uh, project emerged from a competition in which only uh, one design draft was asked for. Since the design by Hadi Tehrani uh, did not meet the strict specifications and uh, the shell concept in order to be able uh, to offer additional space through protruding floors, we finally uh, got the assignment to plan the entire building. First, a few words about the urban situation. Uh, the building is uh, direct, directly located uh, in the western district of Galos. Uh, here, if you follow the arrow, uh, you see the uh, 
the uh, location uh, and uh, it has been under construction uh, uh, sorry um, I, I miss some lines here um, it's located uh, on Frankfurt uh, on the exib exhibition grounds on the corner of Güterplatz Mainzer Landstraße yeah this is uh, uh, you, you see uh, the location uh, when you follow the arrow uh, it forms a striking uh, link between the city center and the new quarter Europa Viertel. The Europa Viertel is located in the western district of Galos and has been under construction since 2005 um, on the areas of the former main freight station. Yeah, you see, uh, it, is here, it, it starts and running uh, through the west of Frankfurt. So I want to show you the master plan here uh, as an impression. Um, the cleared uh, station area has a size of almost 100 hectares and uh, is therefore one of the most important inner city developments in Germany. The 2.5 long area is crossed by the new Europa Allee. The new underground line will also be built on this street until 2025. Around 30,000 people will work and 8 to 10,000 people uh, will live in the entire Europa Viertel. The spin sees itself in urban space as dialogical building. In the base structure, uh, it is in connection uh, in, uh, with this urban space and uh, also with the directly neighboring environment. It closes the edge on the block uh, on the north and the south sides. With a uh, sweeping gesture, uh, the second floor uh, reaches out into the outer space of Güterplatz, offers visitors a spacious uh, roof terrace and uh, pedestrians on the street a generous ca canopy. Bordered on, on three sides by the street, the spin also occupies a neuralgic point for the local public transport. Access to the subway has been integrated in the, into the building here at the north side. From 2025, the uh, U5 line will stop right next to the building. At the top of the screen, Skyscraper, the house corresponds to the vertical urban space of Frankfurt city center. A rigid part of the building with a strictly vertical facade structure emphasizes the classical high-rise design. The part is contrasted with a structure of movement. In the uh, skyscrapers, Stor uh, head. Staggered stories that sweep in and out at the top of the skyscraper offer an urban scale as spatial elements. The spin thus also shows itself as a metaphor for the vertical city. With 33 stories, the house reaches over 128 meters. The spin is also known as a hybrid high-rise because it combines different uses. This essentially consists of a hotel and a office use. The hotel occupies the lower 17 high-rise floors with 240, 228 uh, hotel rooms of the four-star category. Uh, the top of the skyscraper is made uh, up of 10 office floors that create an area of 
8,500 square meters. There are other very different areas of use uh, in the base stories. Lobbies, event and uh, conference rooms, wellness areas and a restaurant. The different uses uh, affect the facades. We have to differentiate between the following requirements. Variable and fixed room layouts, construction change with identical appearance, noise intensive uses neighbored to uses with a high level of sound insulation, opaque areas in front of transfer floors, building sites with radar shielding glasses, Stories uh, with ventil uh, ventilation and smoke extraction openings, stories with and without front roof surfaces, facade in front of three story, and s some more. Uh, and uh, already uh, these different categories already determine uh, the technical and uh, the design challenge. How the following uh, three facade, however, the following three facade constructions are the essential constructions. First, uh, the office facade in the third top of the skyscraper is a unitized box window facade and designed as a ventilated buffer facade. Second, the hotel facade in the part below consists of a single shell element facade uh, with triple glazing. Third, uh, the base stories are constructed as mullion transom facades made of steel profiles. In order, lead, in order to visually bind uh, the building across the 33 floors and to emphasize the plasticity, three structuring elements were used in the competition design. Uh, a white a transparent window field alternate, uh, alternates with a black opaque field made of black granite. Chrome plated uh, pilaster stripes are arranged between the fields and spanning like a network over all floors. Since a high level of transparency was required for all areas of use, we decided in the design phase also to make the opaque areas transparent, but without changing color. This means that black colored glass is now used. Extensive glass sampling was therefore carried out in a very early stage. The selected glasses were then checked again in the sample facade. On the outside, black glass still looks opaque, but seen from the inside, this contrast is sizable, reduced, and the transparency appears continuous. The contrast from the inside is mainly created between the aluminium construction and the glass panels. Here, uh, one of the first uh, photos of the construction site. We see uh, um, the bottom of the uh, actual high-rise building, four to sixth floor. And uh, the elements of the actual high-rise facade also have a so-called negative pilaster element. It is formed by an opaque receding sandwich element. Uh, this component accommodates the smoke control damper in the hotel areas, uh, as we see it here on the screen. In the office area, the element uh, connection and the concealed ventilation slots of the box, box window are located here. Yes, uh, here are these uh, negative pilaster elements. Completion for this project is planned for 2022. 
the protruding offices. Here a photo uh, of the stage of March. Um, uh, these uh, protruding office floors uh, are currently being concreted. Their geometry calls for a special construction process. First, the smaller congruent parts of the slabs are produced. Then, the cantilevered, cantilevered triangle parts are added. And uh, the uh, reinforced concrete st structure is pre-stressed. The building envelope on these floors, which constantly uh, changes between the canopy facade and the roof area, also poses a certain challenge for the assembly. Finally, uh, take a look on some inside and outside impressions. Uh, here is uh, the lobby in uh, the ground floor, the entrance. And next we see uh, here an outlook uh, on the office floor and also there will be an uh, intriguing uh, space on the rooftop area. So next I would like to introduce the Deutschlandhaus to you. Um, here the site plan, the Deutschlandhaus is being built in a very central location in downtown Hamburg and is bordered by uh, streets on three sides. It's, it's located in a so-called BID uh, Opera Boulevard. Uh, the Opera um, of Hamburg is almost opposite. BID or BITS model means uh, business um, improvement districts. This has, has existed in Germany since 2005 and Hamburg is considered a pioneer. BITS are uh, clearly defined uh, business areas in which the residents are organizing their own measures to upgrade the district and to strengthen the retail trade. One program is running over a maximum of five years and uh, bids are financed by the resident land owners through a municipal fee. Around half of this is invested in infrastructure. The remaining money are used for activities. So here an aerial uh, overview, uh, the, there, if you follow the white arrow, you see uh, the location of the new building. Um, uh, the new Deutschlandhaus uh, covers around 4,000 square meters across for area. Um, above ground. Uh, above ground, the building has 10 floors. Uh, the ground floor is reserved for retail and restaurant. The first floor is uh, adjacent to a publicly, uh, assess uh, to a publicly accessible atrium and offers expansion op options for gastronomy and uh, a conference center. The office use uh, extends over the adjoining eight upper floors. It offers around to uh, 29,000 square meters of office space and uh, 30 modern apartments will be built on the Valentinskamp, we see here on the right side. The Deutschlandhaus owes its name from uh, the counting house which was built on this side in uh, 1929. 
uh, based on the designs by the architects Block and Hochfeld. At that time, it also housed one of the largest cinemas in Europe, the uh, Ufa, Ufa Palace. The Deutschland House almost uh, completely destroyed, uh, was almost completely destroyed uh, through the war. The later built uh, replica was unfortunately never able to match uh, the elegance of the original design. And in order to meet aesthetic and technical requirements of our time, it was decided to replace it with a new building. Our design was already based on the urban curvature of the original design during, during the competition process. It's, it adopts its outer contour and its height graduation, and it fits into the surrounding perimeter development. Above all, the design preserves the ensemble with a finance deputation uh, opposite, which you, we only see it here a little bit on the right side, um, uh, which was built in uh, 1926 by the architect Fritz Schumacher, the then chief, co chief construction director of Hamburg. This listed neighbor also determined the choice for the facade material for the Deutschland House, hard-fired bricks. Here we see the photos of the recently completed sample facade. But uh, instead of built being in a horizontal way, the bricks at the Deutschland House are built vertical throughout. Uh, since this uh, masonry bond uh, does not have an overlap between the stones. The stones are pured into concrete. The result is a ventilated precast concrete facade with facing of half, half bricks. And with the joints between the stones about uh, two centimeters behind, showing the surface of the concrete carrier plate. The wide window openings create a picture puzzle consisting of a ribbon facade and a perforated uh, window facade. In order to emphasize the plasticity of the material, the depth of the reveal was enlarged by placing the windows on the inner edge of the framing. At the same time, the tension between the massive curvature and the glass window openings was increased their ratio changes over the height of the building. The first floor, as a bel etage, has a, spatial, has a special floor height that still uh, relates to the ground floor. Above this are the standard floors, of which the window openings progress from floor to floor. They are each 10 centimeters wider and 6 centimeters higher than the floor below, so the proportion, proportion of stone material decreases the further we move away from the ground. The recessed staggered story on the top level finally shows itself to the outside as a complete glass body. The all-glass covering forms the second skin of a double facade. All other window elements in the Deutschland House are designed as single shell mullion transom elements with uh, external sun protection. Since the building is ventilated mechanical, mechanically, uh, opening window only provided uh, comfort ventilation. Primarily, the opening elements are necessary for smoke extraction by the fire brigade. In order to achieve the required volume, the windows were equipped with rotary sliding fittings so that an opening width can be used on both 
sides. Inside, a light flooded atrium with an uh, ellipsoidal floor plan is created. With, it re with its reduced coloring, the interior is in con contrast to the urban exterior, framing the new heart of the house, lush green, surrounded by flat, uh, flat water basins. The 1.80 meter deep plants beds are uh, planted with up to 15 meters high palms and bordered by benches. The atrium is intended to provide an, uh, an attractive lounge and a meeting area for the new Deutschland House and its visitors. It will be a public Uh, it will be a publicly accessible space through which the restaurant or the conference area can be reached directly. And uh, we are certain it will offer a very special atmosphere and will fascinate in the middle of the city. The spatial overlapping balconies rise above this zone and will increasing and with its uh, increasing height uh, they draw closer up to the shape of an exact circle the inward sloping gradation of the cantilevered slabs creates a vault these balconies offers users their own lounging on each floor while at the same time they captured Uh, a bit of a zenithal light for each floor and shield the areas. Okay, uh, this is a very light plan. But uh, I try to explain uh, here this uh, roof construction. At the height of about uh, 35 meters, the atrium is covered by a circular arched roof made of transparent FTFE foils. Um, this uh, foil cushion will have a, a grid size of approximately uh, 3.4 to 3.4 meters. The cushion will be kept in shape by air pressure generated by a small compressor. In addition to the weight saving, an economical construction uh, and, uh, um, and, and uh, the Sorry, I start again. In addition to the weight saving and economical construction, the roof allows two contradicting designs. For fire protection, it can be interpreted as an outside space, and as the foil uh, melts away uh, immediate, immediately in the event of a fire. For thermal insulation, it is used as an interior space. As the atrium is heated to at least 15 degrees, uh, we can uh, have Uh, we can uh, leave out special requirements for the um, atrium facade. The smoke and heat extraction of the atrium takes place via roof uh, flaps that are located around the foil roof all the way around the roof. Uh, uh, maybe you can see it. Here in this former drawing. Thanks to these interpreta uh, interpretations, the atrium facade can be designed without spatial um, room, rooms and uh, without special fire protection. 
Uh, also, uh, we can leave out heat protection requirements. In the first conception, the sun and glare protection was integrated into the beams of the roof um, as uh, a screen fabric underneath the beams. In the meantime, however, the planning has progressed. The glare protection takes place within the foil cushions with the help of a third layer. This third layer is uh, an intermediate layer with an additional raster, partial printing, and partial printing of the foils. The control of the air pressure allows the intermediate layer to oscillate inwards and outwards. On the west side, the offices were placed on an inner courtyard. The courtyard is bounded by a round about 30 meters high closed firewall. Half of this wall will be equipped with vertical greenery and an irrigation system. As in the atrium, this should provide a view of elements of a garden culture. The other half of this area is clad with metal panels that are supposed to reflect the light down to the courtyard. And here, uh, at last, a street view. Uh, the completion for this project is planned for 2023. And uh, currently, the basement floors are being concreted. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I, I have thank to you. ask one more question because also in your yeah. Vita, your project manager, I've seen these two projects uh, very yeah. challenging but different. Yeah. What is the most important thing for project management for that kind of project? What is the challenge for you as project manager to make it on time, in budget, of course? <laughs> Yeah, for you, uh, there are a lot of challenges, uh, as you uh, already realized, uh, because you, in, in, in very early stage, you have uh, um, uh, to look in a, in a, in a mirror of, of, of the future of this project, and uh, you can't see uh, uh, at that early stage the whole development mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you, ne you need for the completion. So you have one step after another and uh, uh, so at the one time you need uh, uh, very uh, uh, profile partners mm -hmm. and professional providers who are also uh, want to run with you in, mm -hmm. in that early stage. Uh, for uh, example, this uh, facade of, of the Deutschland House mm -hmm. is, is a very in intriguing construction. So we, uh, um, and we, we talk with uh, uh, very profiled um, suppliers um, in, in, in the first stages. And also, as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, for the spin. Mm -hmm. Um, also, this glass sampling uh, uh, in, in, in the first phase yeah, yeah. Uh, was uh, a um, yeah. very challenging yeah. part. Uh, so um, we, uh, it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, together with the client um, uh, to, to come to an uh, end in, in, in that phase and to say, okay, it's good uh, to, to go uh, further on. Okay, great. Peter, thanks a lot. Yeah. Talk thank, to you later thank then. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, we, we have started in New York. I, I just see my, my admired Agnes in front of me, so I'm, I'm a little bit have to concentrate now, Agnes. We have started in New York, we came back yeah, to I'm Frankfurt, <laughs> we went to Berlin, we had been in Hamburg, and it's so great to see you, Agnes. It's so great to see you in Dubai. And it's a real, real pleasure to have you here. I mean, I know it's pretty late in Dubai already. 
So, yeah, thank I have you. A thank you. Thank you for staying thank you for awake staying and awake uh, really and having a little bit of opportunity to chat a little bit. Um, we have more than 1,000 people following that live stream today. And guess what? what? What is the biggest community of supporters in that live stream? I actually heard, heard, so I'd like, like to, uh, to say, say something, something in Hungarian, Hungarian to the yes, Hungarian. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Hungarian message. One out of seven of these 1,000 is Hungarian. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more than sure, Agnes, is, it's because of you. Agnes is originated from Hungary, but she's a global citizen. I mean, I also went a little bit into, you, in, into your Vita, and I checked a little bit where you come from and what you have done. I mean, it's, it's an impressive story. I mean, of course, you have started architecture at the University of Hungary, uh, technology and economics, as far as I remember. Um, yeah. But then you went into the United States. You went to North Carolina, went to North Carolina, Carolina and, you and you finished your master's master degree in architecture, architecture there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, and not, it was enough. not enough. You want to deep dive into engineering. So you went to UK at the famous University of Bath. She was just executing the studies for becoming an, an engineer on facades and curtain walls. When, when it comes to your building projects, Agnes, what makes your, and you call it like that, your boutique engineering firm so special in your area? I, I like challenges. I mean, every building is, is different by, by definition, but uh, I, I really like challenges, you know, uh, things that, that are pushing the, uh, the limit of technology and we have to, have to really think and research a little bit and try out. I, I really like experimenting with, uh, uh, with materials and uh, I really like to um, uh, to involve um, uh, suppliers and building material um, producers into into these little experiments and and find solutions to um, to to uh, new trends uh, coming from architects. Uh, let it be geometry, let it be material, let it be uh, extreme big spans. Uh, mm -hmm. th these are all exciting things. Yeah. It's interesting, I mean, of course, I mean, we will then see your presentation, but I mean, you have started your career at Saha Hadid. Uh, you, you went engineering to, to Rumble, you went at Meinhard, and then it's, it's already now 10 years, 10 years that you have your company, Agnes Colte Facades, Colte Facades open in, in Dubai, and already since three years, you're also having a foot in Singapore, in the Asian market. It's um, actually four, or maybe even four, five. It's even four. five in July, okay. yes. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, this 10, 10 years went very, very quick, and uh, it's hard to believe, but 15th of May is our, our 10th anniversary. Yeah, it's amazing. Huh? <laughs> it's, it's great to see you, Agnes. It's a real pleasure. I'm really looking forward for your presentation. Um, I will just also do a little bit, because I, I just went a little bit through some projects, and I, I must say it is, it is fascinating. It's uh, iconic things. For my teammates in Hungary, I have to say, it's the MOL campus in Budapest, which is on your agenda with Foster Partners. Um, very, very interesting, I feel, is Saha did in Dubai, when it comes for me to the icon, which is more or less the void in this very black glass, double bended void in this black glass uh, cube, more or less. And, and that kind of thing is just expressing, and I just summarize it also as, as Mark Whitby did, um, it's just expressing how uh, excellent you engineer on the glass side because the void is double curved and you have made a kind of combination between cold banded and warm banded glass units there. Um, outstanding achievement of, of your team, it's called uh, the, the Opus in Dubai. Uh, yes. Another icon is the Burj Vista. I mean, it's a stepped facade. Uh, you have more or less the stick system, more or less inhaled in these uh, two towers. Um, it is uh, also the, the, the next one, which is also iconic. And uh, I mean, this is going to Arvid Kumar, my friend in Dubai. Uh, I hope he is, he's really realizing that. Um, it's sky view. And the sky view is also extremely interesting. It's more or less this ellipsoid ground shaped, two towers, 220 meters, something tall. 
a huge massive sky bridge in between both of them. Um, and this is expressing your engineering talents. And I hope in your presentation you have your last masterpiece also to share with us, which is called the Museum of the Future. Yes, indeed. And um, we are working currently on some very interesting projects as well. So I'm pretty sure that I, uh, uh, I can uh, show interesting new things uh, at every event. Uh, I just hope there will be more events. Yes. <laughs> Agnes, great. Let's start. I mean, we have recorded your session, so more or less we will start now with a recording and, and present this to the audience. And to make that happen... Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes. And to make that happen, I mean, also I would like uh, just to phrase about some things I found out in Internet, Agnes. Just listen. Because this is printed in stone in the Internet. It will not be lost. And it's only about Agnes. It is that she is an excellent and talented engineer. You remind yourself, she's analytical, she has a clear-cut methodology to analyze issues. She's detail-loving, she's just doing it. And what I like the most, and this is really uh, something which is uh, going to the bones more or less when you hear this, from Mark Whitby, he just said, I mean, this lady is just the best in our business. Agnes, looking forward for your presentation. Thanks a lot. Hi, welcome in our office. I'm Agnes Koltai from Koltai Facet, and uh, let's start with our presentation. I was given this topic, Think Global, Build Local by Vicona. And it's a very exciting topic, mostly because we do build global. All the little marks here are projects that we have been completed or working on, uh, and it's interesting to think about how uh, you can cover as facades consultants for the, for the building envelope all this knowledge for all the local uh, uh, parameters. So thinking of it, uh, I realized that what really gives us strength is our team. Uh, our team, uh, which comes from many, many different countries uh, or offices. We have Dubai and Singapore office. Uh, but within the team, within the cultural background of the people, the life experience of the people, the working experience and travel experience of the people, many of us worked in different countries before ending up in Dubai or Singapore. Uh, we have a giant amount of, of international experience and knowledge which we can rely on, we can, we can base on. So in order to think global, what we need is diversity, respect each other, learn from each other, and not only within the team, but also when we have new locations, learning from the clients, learning from the architects, learning by, from the local um, uh, contractors and builders, uh, processing all that information, comparing it to uh, or, or, uh, other experiences. Um, building local. So uh, still you have many local aspects that you have to consider. Most important, of course, first that comes to everyone's mind, is climate considerations, local environmental considerations. Second one is uh, even more localized within that plot, within that district or, or street. The third one uh, is, of course, um, uh, the, the availability and uh, uh, the local uh, technology available at, at uh, that country, the local building, uh, uh, building um, uh, practices. Uh, a very important one is expectations. Expectations from the local clients, the local end users, the local operators, uh, and the lifestyle that they are, they are aiming for, for certain functions. Uh, and then, least but not least, uh, reputation. The building especially the facade and the appearance of the building, will give the foundations of the reputation of that master builder or, or re represent that bank or, or uh, uh, do marketing different ways. It could be an iconic building, and there's something that came up recently, uh, Instagrammability, uh, which could be important even for certain buildings. Uh, Global considerations, which is always true on, on every project, we have to consider our, our global climate, the energy use of the building, uh, 
bringing it up to, uh, to compatible in international standards, uh, even if uh, local regulations could, could allow for, for a bit more, more leeway, uh, in conversation with the client, in conversation with global clients or local clients, uh, to see their aim and then to follow uh, 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 energy expectations, uh, trends, uh, technology uh, changes, uh, and or impact uh, on the built environment and on, on, the, uh, on the natural environment. Um, so these are some buildings arranged on this slide that we, we designed worldwide. And you may say, and you are completely right, that any of these buildings more or less could have been built uh, in, in any country. Uh, but thinking about how these local uh, considerations are changing uh, the, the, the final outlook and the actual detailing and the actual specification of a building, those global buildings became local, very, very localized. And that's very important in, in facade engineering. So let's jump on the first project I wanted to, to show you. A few projects we go through from different countries, just highlighting one or two um, items which are uh, they, uh, part of the global thinking process, but uh, still very, very localized. I was telling you about Instagram, Instagramability. He, here it is. These are all pictures from the Instagram. I'm not really sure who these paper, people are, but they all uh, uh, thought that it's important that they have a picture on Instagram with this nice looking building at the background. Uh, this makes uh, uh, the city, the builder, uh, the, the building uh, 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 well known as well. So this is here Museum of the Future in Dubai. The building, uh, again, uh, very interesting innovative shape. It could be built uh, at, at many places, yet it's, it's localized by, uh, 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 e even in design, by applying, um, applying elements of the local culture. Uh, namely calligraphy, the art of calligraphy, and the art of Arabic poetry. Uh, it's, it's a poem uh, written on this building about the future uh, by, by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. Um, this building has a diagrid um, uh, structural, uh, structural uh, uh, frame, and then the cladding on it Honestly, we, we were on the contractor side on this, uh, for this building. We were helping the contractor to actually uh, design and realize this, this dream. Um, it's a museum about the future. Uh, it was very important for us to, to find technologies that expresses this, this futuristic way of thinking. So uh, the, com the building is completely curved. Uh, it has uh, uh, panels, the function, uh, unitized panels. The function is uh, museum. So on, uh, on this uh, uh, side, it's escape staircases. And the other side, it's all floors, museum floors, nine meter uh, internal uh, height. Uh, and it will exhibit future technologies. It will uh, represent the, the UAE government's uh, uh, vision of, a, of an automated, transparent, uh, very, very high-tech governing style, uh, as well as do research and have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, presentations and, and symposiums on, uh, uh, on the research of future technologies. The building is about 130 meter long and 85 meter high. The panels uh, are spanning whole floor, so about nine meter tall and approximately 2.2 meter uh, wide. They are all different shape, uh, and they are all different uh, in, in every way. They are cast out of GRP, phased with a, laminated, uh, or phased with a, with a stainless steel sheet. The stainless steel is coming from uh, in, in this pattern. Uh, these are relatively big bumps. Uh, it's a RIMAX product called uh, 6WL, and it was um, meeting the, the architect's aesthetic uh, vision of not having a, a very, very shiny object, but having this shine, this, this life on the, on the building uh, at, a, at a scattered stripe instead of a certain point. 
So, so the, the reason for this bump is to, to scattering the light. On the other hand, in this climate, in, in Dubai, uh, the salty and, and dusty environment uh, would not make abrasively treated like, uh, uh, like satin finished or, uh, or uh, brushed finished stainless steel uh, be very um, corrosion resistant uh, as external cladding. So the, the right choice is a, is a pressed metal uh, for, for any patterning, a pressed stainless steel which was applied here with additional surface treatment. Uh, the units are, are fully insulated uh, and then uh, I would like to show something which is a global trend coming up on, uh, on, uh, in architecture more and more. It started in architecture more than 20, uh, more like 30 years ago, parametric design, uh, but slowly, slowly it's coming into, uh, coming into uh, manufacturing and uh, construction as well. So uh, this is a local implement implementation of a global trend. Um, the, the red ones are actually spandrels and the green ones are, are vision glazing. This is a museum, so it does not need uh, too, too much light uh, inside. Uh, but when you look at this surface model, uh, you would notice that uh, it's, it's just, just a line. And if you remember the panel I showed before, it has 400 depth. So the glass comes in flat pieces. When, when you look at the surface, in more detail, sometimes the flat pieces would actually stick out from the, from the curved um, uh, cladding zone. So that's one of the exercises we did. For example, um, uh, pick the, the letters, uh, which are glazed openings, um, see how they fit onto the panel. Um, they would most probably be, so if, if this, is, this is one panel, most probably a bit off-grid uh, uh, com coming in and out. So um, by this script, uh, it would uh, bring the, the values from the Rhino model. Uh, this script is, is, we call it flattening script, so it would iterate the piece of glass until all the points fit into the, the surface and all the points also um, align with the adjacent uh, panel, uh, 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 glass panel. Uh, and then visualization, we go back to the, to the model and put the glass at the right place. So this is what's happening here. The, uh, the glass will be iterated until all these points uh, get into a location where it fits to the, to the curve, curve surface and aligns exactly with the uh, with the other uh, glass piece, uh, so it becomes buildable. Um, yes, so these are a few beautiful pictures uh, of Museum of Future. Uh, it's completed now, it will open soon. The architect was Killer Design, um, the main contractor is BAM, uh, and uh, it's built by the Dubai Future Foundation. Uh, the next project I would like to introduce to you is in Hungary, in a cold climate country. And it's designed by Fostersen Partner with the, with the local partner Finta Studio. Uh, it's uh, commissioned by uh, MOL, uh, a local uh, oil uh, company. And this is their new headquarter building. Um, they, they aimed for um, uh, uh, an iconic building it's the tallest tower in, in Budapest, 32 floors, uh, with, a, with a roof garden, a podium, and an interesting uh, sky garden area, and very high uh, energy performance. Um, this building as well has um, uh, um, double curved um, parts. Uh, and again, uh, I would just like to show it as another example for application of parametric design, and then we will go forward uh, with, with a few more aspects. Uh, so you see how the, the tower merges into, into uh, the, the podium itself. Uh, the podium is, is opening up in, uh, in a plan, and the tower is uh, um, getting narrower as we go up. So uh, th there are a lot of corners and uh, item uh, panels on the, on the facade which are um, double curved or interesting geometry. Uh, the the uh, scripting, the Rhino scripting we, we did on it uh, was aiming first of all to uh, optimize the, the modulation uh, in a way that we gain 
um, relatively repetitive and relatively similar geometry uh, element. And then, in a second step, we also uh, ensured that the surface model, when it's cut to, to these panels, to these pieces, each glass piece is actually, um, uh, actually um, manufacturable. Um, so we made sure that the, the surface of each piece fits either on a cylinder, cylindrical uh, shape or a conical shape, uh, or uh, the, uh, the offset of one corner is so slight that it can be cold bent, and only uh, a minimum amount of glass is getting formed by, uh, by uh, gravity sagging uh, in, a, in a hot bent uh, way. So that's cost optimization as well as optimization of, uh, of time and, and uh, client's budget. Uh, let's go to the, to the next slide where uh, I have a, a small video showing uh, how the script works. So uh, it has, uh, the green is flat, blue is cold vent, yellow is cylindrical, pink is conical, and the uh, red is double curved shapes. So first let's see uh, the flat shapes. These are all completely flat. Uh, let's see the cylindrical shapes. Uh, if we select uh, one of these, uh, which are closed cylindrical. Uh, so from the surface model, it, it would not be necessary cylindrical yet. Uh, but we, we place a lot of points on the surface and we play with those points with the, with the script to push or pull them into the completely cylindrical geometry. Uh, so that's what you, you saw here. And now you see another one with a conical shape. It's getting getting optimized to fit perfectly on a on a cone. Yes, um, the next slide shows um, a, a more traditional uh, and very important step in the design. Again, this is something that is done worldwide, globally, good practice on on every tall building or complex shape building. This is wind tunnel test. Uh, but it always gives uh, not even local results. The inputs are local because the wind environment is different uh, at every location. But, but also the, the output is very, very specialized, the actual shape of the, of the building. So this uh, allows us to provide a safe design for the framing and the, and the gloss and all the bracketry uh, or any other um, cladding material which is, which is fixed on the facade. Uh, and also to optimize the, uh, the mullion sizes uh, to, uh, to gain uh, the, the most out of it, to gain repetitiveness. Uh, usually uh, the very, very high wind load areas are very small, so they get stiffened rather than uh, designed for, for, the, for the whole building. Um, on this building, we, we selected a female-female system which uh, has a better thermal performance uh, uh, f uh, and that's uh, a very good uh, choice for, for the location, the cli cold climate location. And additionally, it allows for, for the bent uh, shapes to fit together easier uh, when, when it's in construction. Um, the, this is a, a vertical detail with the stack joint, again, a female female stack joint with, with a large gasket. Uh, and it has this bull nose feature, uh, which is catering for, for uh, snow load. Uh, and also an important local consideration were icicles, uh, uh, not to let icicles form and, uh, and drop from the, from the building. Another global practice with local results is uh, acoustic mapping, noise mapping. Uh, this particular building is near to a, a railway station, uh, and you see the, the dark blue uh, is, is very noisy, uh, and the, the light green is, is the least noisy area. So one side of the building, this, this here is our, uh, our, our uh, building, one side of the building needs to receive a, stronger, uh, uh, higher specification acoustic treatment than the, than the other side. Uh, this is carried out by selecting uh, appropriate glazing. Um, so th this side of the building will have higher uh, specification uh, acoustic treatment. And it's always a balance in between what's uh, required structurally 
what's required acoustically, uh, and what's cost efficient, uh, what meets the performance, and what me meets the aesthetics. Uh, you would not want to see uh, different uh, color shades in patches on the, on the building. So it's a, it's a complex process, but an exercise which is always carried out with the, with the local aspects. So um, the last project uh, I wanted to mention is continuing on the theme of uh, Unitize system. Uh, um, this is uh, in Dubai, it's Skyview. It's uh, two towers connected with a, with a bridge, a three-story bridge, um, infinity pool on top and a tourist feature observation deck. Um, uh, it, it's uh, an email project. Um, designed a concept designed by SOM look, with the local architects uh, NOR. The main contractor was ACC and then we have a number of subcontractors for the, for the project. Um, the, the modulization optimization exercise on this project was not as complex because it's not 3D shaped. So we did it without any scripting uh, but still, because of the, the uh, curved floor plates, we aimed at a very early stage to, uh, to make the, the, the building more repetitive uh, in terms of using the same uh, uh, mullions uh, multiple times. Uh, the least uh, number of extrusion you, you get, the more uh, cost efficient and quicker the construction can, can become. So uh, what, we, what we did here is um, um, playing with the arcs in, in AutoCAD, playing with the, with the uh, merging point of the, of the arcs, the location of that, uh, and playing a little bit with the radiuses, playing with the modulation a little bit. These are changes which are almost unnoticeable. Uh, here on the left side you see the, the original architectural um, uh, floor plan and or improved version on the, on the, on the right side. So, you almost see no difference if I don't point it out, yet the first uh, uh, version uh, uses more dice than the, than the second version when we go with, uh, with the kinks, uh, in, uh, kinks, kink angle allowed in between uh, uh, two, uh, the split mullion, the two parts of the split mullion. So um, again, wind tunnel test. Uh, I come back to it because it's again a global practice with local implementation. Here I can show you some, some pictures how, how wind tunnel test is done. Uh, it's, a, it's a scaled model of the building uh, with the whole uh, built environment built. Sometimes uh, for very new developments it's even done twice with, with no buildings around and with the future vision of the surroundings. Um, and then uh, wind tunnel uh, with, a, with a very big uh, high uh, um, high, uh, uh, high efficiency uh, fan generates the, the wind. This is a turntable, so the different uh, typical wind directions can be, uh, can be tested. Uh, the result of this wind tunnel test is, is a similar uh, map. Uh, in this case, it's less colorful, but I highlighted the, the areas in red which have the, the highest wind uh, pressures. Uh, Numbers are different here, but the, but the approach is similar. Uh, we would design the, uh, the framing uh, to fit uh, a good 70% of the building uh, minimum, uh, stiffen the rest uh, to avoid uh, multiple mullion, mullion depths, uh, and then also design the glass uh, to, to withstand the, the pressure it needs, combined again with the, with the acoustic uh, requirements. This here is the, uh, the acoustic uh, uh, requirement markup of the same building. One side of this building is facing uh, a very big uh, junction uh, with uh, heavy traffic, so the, uh, the acoustic requirement would be higher there, uh, and, uh, uh, and the other side would be, uh, would be lower. Again, uh, with uh, laminated glass, uh, acoustic lamination if needed, uh, helps this, but, uh, but then uh, with the mullion design you have to ensure that the plane of the, of the building is still kept either by playing with the, uh, with the uh, uh, cavity, playing with adapters uh, and some other, other solutions to, to ensure that everything is in line. Um, 
this building also has stainless steel, and again, I, I mentioned that in uh, um, uh, harsh environments, uh, so salty and uh, um, uh, dusty environments, pressed metals work very well. This is a linen finish uh, stainless steel. And for the system selection, this building actually uh, is large and complicated enough to have almost every system on it. Uh, so th this building has a lot of unitized system, uh, the majority of the, of the project. Uh, it is a male-female system, uh, which is from uh, Technal, uh, who's in the same group, hydro group, with, with Vicona. Uh, Technal uh, worked with uh, the, the contractor to, uh, to um, modify the system for the needs and extrude the, the actual extrusions, which were working the best for the, for the project. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see our uh, IFC drawing issued for construction and the contractor's final version. Uh, you see that it's very minor differences. Uh, the major um, uh, geometric uh, restraints are, are respected. Uh, the inside of the, of the stack joint or the inside of the, uh, of the uh, split mullion uh, could, could be different, uh, inertia uh, or, or, or the, the performance of the, of the two solutions is the, is the same. Uh, here we have an anti-buckling clip and we had a, a, a boxed out uh, section. Uh, from the outside, same appearance. These are the little changes that could happen uh, from our um, tender drawing set, IFC drawing set, to, uh, to the, the reality of the project. Uh, we also have stick system. Uh, it's a high-rise building, but interestingly, the stick system is the top part of it. Uh, these two uh, ends of the towers above the sky bridge are formed like little pavilions, uh, and th uh, their geometry is even more curved and even more um, diverse than, than the tower before, so we opted for a, for a more flexible uh, stick system here, which is not ideal for high-rise, but here uh, you can build it from uh, scaffolded and build from the, uh, from the top of the uh, sky bridge, so it's basically like, like uh, building a low-rise building. A few details, it's a typical stick system uh, with stiffeners if needed. And then we have some uh, additional interesting systems on this building. Um, we have a panoramic lift, we have a tensioned cable wall at the lobby, and then we have the glass floored observation deck. Uh, these are details of the, the, tensioned, uh, 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 the tensioned glass wall at the lobby. It's patch fitted, so the glass is supported at, at four sides. And the next slide is some construction images. Um, while it was, was built. And a similar patch fitted system is applied for the panoramic lift enclosure, except uh, here it's uh, fixed to, uh, to a steelwork, architectural steelwork structure. A few pictures uh, during construction. And this, uh, uh, this um, project also has a very Instagrammable uh, uh, um, place, and that's the infinity pool on top and the beautiful view from here. I especially like this view because uh, the buildings uh, indicated by the, by the arrows are other projects that we worked on uh, in, in the downtown area. So um, if, you, if you go and swim to the edge of this pool, uh, you would have the view uh, something like this, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, that's my last slide. And I thank you very much for your Attention. Thank you so much, Agnes. And we are almost through the program. It is the very end of the presentations. It is two hours, 30 minutes. We are almost on time. Um, we, we have flown. I mean, I, I hope. Out there, you have felt it. We have, we have come from New York. We went back into the German legacy, went to Berlin, went to Hamburg. We went to Dubai. We covered the globe from San Francisco until Beijing. I hope the guy in Beijing is still awake because it must be close to 3 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning for that one. Um, 
just to finish more or less that kind of presentation, I really would like to get uh, the presenters here in the next studio by Vicona and partners back on stage. It is uh, Peter Olbert from Hadi Teherani. It is uh, Juan Lucas Young from Sauvo Hatten. And I also like to have Torsten more or less as a deputy of Kai-Uwe Bergmann from Bjarke English Group with us. Um, I have just one last question, which is exactly the same for all of us, of all, all of you. Um, in Germany, it's more or less going to be late afternoon. Um, tomorrow is your new day. We have seen that art, architecture, engineering is thrilling us. What kicks you off tomorrow morning to go back to the office? Peter. Oh. <laughs> that, <laughs> expect, expect the unexpected. This is part of the format. Uh, question. Uh, uh, I, uh, today I get new inspirations. Yeah. And uh, um, there are... Uh, our job is, uh, is a very um, wide-ranging job, uh, which I uh, very appreciate. Mm -hmm. I, I love my job, so for me, it's uh, I will stand up every day to have this uh, to do these intriguing projects. Huh? Yeah. So. Well, Lucas. Well, same goes to me. I mean, <laughs> I'm lucky enough to do what I like, so I enjoy it. I have tomorrow. I have a few things after arriving from Frankfurt. <laughs> I have a couple of meetings and um, about competitions we are doing. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit of design work mm -hmm. uh, to be done to, uh, tomorrow and some other stuff like that. But yeah, I mean always very excited about you know running the office and running the projects and discovering new things and um, being a beat about everything that happens so great thanks a lot Agnes did you did you hear the, the question it's, no, it's, I missed the question it's late night in in Dubai tomorrow morning six o'clock uh, again you have to wake up what thrills no. you what th no you have a day off no. No, it's Friday. Friday, Friday, Saturday, Friday is a day off. <laughs> yeah. Nevertheless, Sunday comes, so you work on Sundays. Yes. Uh, <laughs> then again, Wallace, the question is, what, what kicks you out of bed and say, yes, Chaga, I go back to office and uh, art, architecture and engineering thrills me through the day? What kind of... Honestly, we have so much to do right now. Um, 2021 started much better than, uh, than 2020. Uh, so... So it's, uh, it's quite a lot. Uh, to be honest, I think I will do some work uh, tomorrow and, and Saturday as well. Uh, although I will not get up at 6 o'clock for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, we, ha we have quite a few interesting new projects. Um, and one which uh, you will hear about soon because now it's completed is, the, is a glass structure. On, uh, on Skyview there's uh, a, a glass slide, a tourist attraction, which is, which is now completed and uh, soon will open. Um, and, uh, and other buildings all over the world. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's just more or less the energy coming out of the building projects, which is really kicking all of us into the daily business. Thorsten, what is, what is your favorite uh, stand up every day and push yourself? Uh, and uh, maybe not pushing, but you are just pulled into the business. Well, uh, good question, uh, Werner. Um, well, I love what I have seen today, really. And um, as I have a strong technical background, as probably most of the characters in our industry, um, my profession is sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have seen today, again, how um, architecture can define brands. We have seen projects from Bjarke Ingels Groups, from uh, Sauerbruch Hatten, as well as from Hadi Terani. And finally, from Agnes. Uh, by the way, hello, Agnes. Long time no see. Um, <laughs> um, how an engineer, a facade consultant, approach uh, projects and how uh, Agnes uh, contributes um, and explain how to transform architecture visions into, mm. into, into reality. And um, yeah, I mean... That's, that's, is, that's basically yeah, the core of our this, this daily business. Yeah? Almost the closing word of today. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. This was the second international Next Facade Summit 
here broadcasted from the studio in Frankfurt. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Thorsten, and uh, also give the kind regards to Kai Uwe. Uh, Agnes, great, thank you so much uh, to stay tuned until the end of the event. Uh, excellent presentation made, by the way. Looking forward to really see you physically somewhere, somehow, somewhere. All the good luck for 21. Uh, Juan Lucas, thank thanks you. for being with us, uh, coming from Berlin here, presenting us more or less all these kind of nice projects, and you see that the future is really coming with new ideas. Uh, Peter, thanks for presenting all of the activities of Hadi Tehrani and your active uh, parts on that one. Really looking forward to stay tuned. And if you want to stay connected with us, just follow the next studio in Frankfurt. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn, then you will be really updated uh, with all this kind of information. And last but not least, if the second session was good for, new, for you and you really want to have more of that, uh, stay tuned. The third session will be launched in June on 24th. Looking forward and have a nice evening. Thanks a lot to all of you. <laughs> Bye, Agnes. See you soon again. Huh? Bye. Discover Next, the studio for facades and design. Next is the platform for innovation in the field of building envelopes, for inspiration, information and communication. Initiated by Vicona, with leading industry experts as Next partners. Next is a unique concept which is constantly evolving and bringing the future of cities to life.